My name is Boyende Onijal. I'm the Executive Director of the Department of Communications and Community Outreach. And we're so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy schedules to join us for a very important conversation on priorities for our school system as our superintendent begins the work on preparing her um, request for FY26. We want to recognize some folks who are in the room with us. Delegate Cheryl Pasteur, good evening, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We have board member Janie Lichter, thank you so much for joining us. Let me see if I missed anyone. And all of you, you are all VIPs tonight, so thank you, thank you for joining us. So tonight you're gonna hear from Dr. Raja. She has a short presentation um, to share. We have a Budget 101 video to play for you. And then after that, we're really going to engage in conversation where you'll be able to discuss amongst yourselves at your table, what are some of the priorities that Dr. Rogers needs to be thinking about as she prepares her budget request? What does that look like for BCPS? Where are we already seeing some results? Following that group conversation, we will open it up to general question and answer, and Dr. Rogers is prepared to answer your questions about the budget, about the process, about what the funding means for Team BCPS, and what we're planning to do as we look ahead um, for our school system. So again, welcome, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to play the video and then immediately following the video, Dr. Rogers will share her presentation and then we'll engage in small group conversation. So here we go. Our vision to be among the highest performing school systems in the state and nation. Our purpose to increase achievement for all students and prepare students to thrive in college, career or the military. Every day, BCPS welcomes and engages more than 110,000 students in 176 schools, programs, and centers. Our work is driven by the core belief that all students can succeed. BCPS provides the instruction, services, and support Team BCPS students need to reach their highest potential. We do this through our operating budget, which pays for the staff, resources, and materials our schools need. It is important that our community understands how the BCPS operating budget is developed and funded and how the money is spent. Work on the operating budget for the next fiscal year typically begins in the summer with a preliminary estimate completed by the fall. After considering all requests from BCPS offices and reviewing recommendations from schools, system leadership and stakeholder groups, the superintendent submits a proposed budget to the Board of Education in January. The proposed operating budget is a reflection of our values, high expectation for students and staff, and commitment to moving BCPS forward. The Board of Education holds public hearings to gather comments and feedback from the community, and then works to finalize their budget proposal which is submitted to the Baltimore County Executive and the County Council. The county also holds a public hearing and approves a budget for the county, which includes BCPS. 49% of the total BCPS budget comes from Baltimore County government. Nearly 41% of the budget comes from the state, and almost 10% comes from federal and other sources. The vast majority of the BCPS operating budget goes into the classroom. For every dollar in our budget, more than 63 cents is spent on instruction, including teachers, principals, staff, and instructional materials. About 15 cents of every dollar goes to other services for schools like bus transportation for more than 80,000 students a day, nutritious meals, and support staff including social workers, psychologists, custodial and maintenance workers. About six cents of every dollar is spent on central office staff. Our central office team does critical work, including hiring teacher and staff training and providing direct support and oversight to our 176 schools, programs and centers. Overall, nearly 82% of the BCPS operating budget goes to pay for salaries and benefits to support and retain our outstanding Team BCPS staff members. 
The BCPS operating budget lays out the strategies we will use to fast forward our successes and match them with the investments we need to implement the strategy. Our collective efforts and strategic investments will help make BCPS a world-class system in the state and nation. All right, so before Dr. Rogers comes up, I do want to recognize, and I just saw Delegate Phillips, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for being here and for engaging in a conversation on the operating budget with us. As Ms. Onijala said, I'm going to provide you with an overview, but we really want you to have an opportunity to engage with each other and then for us to have an opportunity to engage uh, as a whole group. You have seen this information before if you're familiar with our budget. Uh, you've seen our four school priorities, our four system priorities, uh, really focus on academic achievement, but the other three areas, infrastructure, safety and climate, highly effective teachers, leaders and staff, are all integral parts of how we get to high academic achievement for every single student. Um, it's important for us last year as we developed the budget and this year as we go through the process to create the FY26 budget that we're able to see whatever investments we're recommending, we're able to see a direct through line to one of the system priorities. So one of the questions that we're often asked is where does the money come from for the operating budget and where does it go? The video provide a high level overview. Um, wanted to share again that we are very um, fortunate to have local share. Uh, from Baltimore County government, we receive 49% of our budget. Um, the next uh, share is from the state of Maryland, that's approximately 41%, and all of the other sources combined for the remaining uh, part of our operating budget, which is $2.6 billion. In terms of where we spend our money, the video went over this very quickly, but I think it's important for everyone to understand. 82, just about 82% of our budget is for staff for the salaries and the benefits. Additionally, about 63 cents of every dollar goes directly to support student instruction, their instructional materials, the teachers in the classroom, the principals in the building, assistant principals, et cetera. We have another 15 cents that goes to other services that are very important. How do we transport 80,000 students to and from schools? The healthy meals that we are providing, breakfast and lunch free, two years in a row to every single student. Um, our counselors, our psychologists, our uh, teachers that support special education, our speech pathologists, all of that is accounted for in that amount. And sometimes we hear about central office and how much money is being spent in central office. And so it's important for us to share the factual information with all members of our community. And that is six cents of every dollar to operate a $2.6 billion budget, 176 schools and growing, 111,000 students, 20,000 adults, six cents of every dollar is spent for central office to operate every part of the entire school system. As we prepare for fiscal year 2026, uh, we wanna think about what we invested in last year. Um, some of our investments uh, went to reducing class sizes for grades three through five, making sure that we're compensating all of our staff members across Team BCPS in every union fairly. Everyone, for the first time, we have a three-year contract, so no one who is employed with us is thinking about what their livelihood is, so it allows all of us to really focus our efforts on what's in the best interest of our students. Um, two years before we had to, by law, Blueprint requires it uh, by, I think, 2026 or 27, uh, but we were advanced uh, $60,000 starting salary for our teachers, um, which helps us in our recruitment efforts. Uh, this was a part of it. We also believe our retention efforts led not only to lower turnover than we've seen in years, but also to us opening schools with more than 99% of our schools fully staffed. We can't recall the last time that occurred, meaning you had full-time professional teachers that were inside of our classrooms uh, providing instruction to our students. 
looking at our mathematics data and the needs of our students, particularly in elementary school to set that foundation and then matriculate to middle school and high school. We invested heavily in an elementary math teacher um, lead teacher pilot to provide that direct instruction that was necessary. We provided staff development teachers in all of our schools and they are people who are in the exact in each school and they provide help not only to new teachers but also to um, maybe some veteran teachers who are in need of support or veteran teachers who um, you know need some additional strategies to meet the needs of students. We were able to invest at least a minimum of a 0.5 staff development teacher in every school for that job embedded professional development and coaching that is necessary. Uh, we were able to also um, invest in more special education teachers, uh, virtual um, uh, online teachers, our uh, teachers that met the needs of our multilingual learners and our special area teachers in elementary school. Um, that is particularly important because it allows for the time that's necessary for our content teachers in elementary school to plan instruction to change um, based on the data that they're receiving uh, from the students in real time. We are piloting uh, the second part of the pilot on the secondary English uh, literacy uh, curriculum and looking forward to that data and to provide a recommendation in the spring about who to move forward with for next year. We invested in a new multilingual learner uh, curriculum this year that we have uh, available in all of our schools. Expanded access to full day pre-K. Baltimore County Public Schools, as large as we were, um, we used to have a little more than 2,000 half day pre-K seats about three years ago. Um, we moved from, uh, the, with that 2,300 full day seats, um, last year we were able to add um, 800 and at the start of this year we now have more than 2,000 full day seats in addition to the uh, 2,400 half day seats uh, for our pre-kindergartners. We know that adding, providing students with high quality pre-K makes a significant difference, not only in their experience and families' experiences while they're young, but it makes a significant difference on them and has an impact on their entire educational career. That has been true, uh, proven time and time again. And so we are very proud of the ability to not only to expand across our schools and to make that expansion based on our data where there were needs, but also to make sure that we are, um, that all those seats are filled. Um, last time we checked, we had uh, less than 20 seats uh, that were open. And I'm sure if I check today, we probably have no seats uh, that are open uh, for our students. One of the things we knew we had to do was to level set about what our expectations were. When we're talking about high quality teaching and learning, what is that? Does it mean the same thing to everyone? So we went back to the basics. We invested heavily in professional development. As a direct result of that, we provided 30 days of professional learning across last summer. Um, we were uh, warned that people would not come over the summer. I am so um, proud to have good partners across our unions. We do have our union president teacher, union president Cindy Sexton here, who joined us in writing a letter along with all the other presidents to all of our staff. And as a result, we had more than 5,400 teachers show up last June in the summer after having students all year long for professional learning. So the first time in a long time and we believe that that has made all the difference in terms of what our students um, have received from day one. Elementary schools, we heard from our principals, from our assistant principals, from our families, that the earlier we can intervene, the earlier that we're able to identify needs that students have, the earlier we can provide the support that they need. And so we were very proud and excited to provide IEP facilitators to all of our elementary schools uh, to work directly with families and work directly with our students. Um, we expanded on-site access to college courses uh, based on a partnership that we have with CCBC. So Transportation is not a barrier to our students. The professors comes, come directly on campus for students to engage in those college courses. And lastly, um, expanded our safety assistant program. We brought on safety area leads for all three of our zones and floaters for our zones in case there were emergent issues in the community. Those safety assistant leads could come and provide that intermittent support that was necessary for our schools. So last year, 
I shared with everyone that the ESSER funding was ending, at that the blueprint percentage was going down, and we were going to have to make some really tough decisions about what we were going to do because we still knew that our students had some very significant needs that we had to address. And so last year, we buckled down, everybody was involved, we made $105 million worth of cuts, we were uh, fully funded uh, from the county executive as well as the county council for our budget, and we were definitely looking for some breathing room and a break this year, being able to restore some more things to our budget. If you see the news headlines, it doesn't look like it's likely. Um, it has, uh, Governor Moore has signaled um, as late as last week, I think November 4th was the most recent article um, about the adjustments that are gonna have to be made to the blueprint. Why is this important to you? One of the most significant parts of the blueprint is the foundation. In essence, based on your enrollment, it's how much money you receive per pupil in your school system. So we're 111,000 students and growing. That's a significant amount of money for us. Last, or this current fiscal year, the percentage was cut in half from last year, uh, more than cut in half, it was 1.7%. That's what we're operating with this year. The plan for next year was almost 5%, so more than double that, which was going to be signif a significant amount of money to allow us to restore um, different things and allow us to continue and explore um, strategies that we needed to move forward. What we believe is that's not going to happen. Um, the, Governor Moore has been very clear that we're gonna to have to make some adjustments in terms of blueprint funding. And at the same time, we know that while our data is trending in the right direction, we still have work to do. And so that is going to make it incumbent upon us to be extremely responsible and diligent as we prepare this recommended budget to um, propose to the Board of Education. We allocate our resources in three ways. We start with the same thing with the state, which is foundation funding based on enrollment. Everybody has a baseline. Based on your number of students, we provide a per pupil expenditure and that's where we start. Then on top of that, we look at need. And so when we're talking about need, we're talking about um, students with, uh, who are economically disadvantaged. We're also talking about multilingual learners. We're also talking about students who receive special education services. We provide additional staffing and funding um, in those areas. And then lastly, programs. When we have special programs, uh, special programs uh, many times come with additional staff, and so we provide that additional staff that's necessary Necessary, whether we're talking about an AVID program or a magnet program that requires a specialty teacher, that's another layer of staffing that pr we provide to our schools. And so given the fiscal outlook, um, we are continuing to um, engage in two of the strategies that we employed last year. One is we have a central office freeze that is in effect. Um, instead of simply hiring for positions as they become available, whether someone is promoted or someone retires or they resign. Um, central office positions are on a freeze. There is an exception process where if it's a critical position uh, that an application can be filled and that can be um, uh, approved for us to post and hire for the critical positions. And then we're doing zero-based budgeting. Um, this is gonna be the second year that Baltimore County Public Schools is doing zero-based budgeting. Uh, zero-based budgeting is different from how we typically used to do budgeting because in a, with a very large budget, you typically, everyone would start, every department would start with the same amount of money that you had last year. You would go through that and then you would add additional requests. Um, we stopped that process. Everybody starts with zero, and then you have to build a budget. Your budget has to be aligned to actual expenditures, and if there is a request for something additional, we are looking for additional um, 
in areas where we're building new facilities or you have the enrollment, the students are going to specific areas where we need to expand our spending in those areas. We are going to evaluate all expenditures, department by department, division by division, um, again this year to make sure that we are not putting anything in the recommended budget that we don't need for our students and staff to do the work. Our budget timeline, we're right now in developing the budget plan. Um, it's also the time where we are seeking stakeholder feedback. Um, in addition to having these budget uh, meetings, we also, uh, it should be in your inbox, we also have sent out a stakeholder survey. We have a different survey that we send out to our principals to find out what their priorities are. I meet monthly with our principals in small groups, as well as with our central office leaders to hear their uh, their input um, to provide them with some different scenarios and suggestions and for us to problem solve as well. Our area advisory councils provide opportunities for um, people to share input and feedback on the budget. We present to the Council of PTAs to speak to the leadership directly um, to provide them with an opportunity for input. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing something um, in terms of other opportunities that we have for uh, feedback for staff, um, for community members to provide uh, input on the budget process. But after, so that's before we develop the budget. We take all that into account. We uh, develop a budget, present it um, to the community and to our Board of Education, and then there are additional opportunities, um, work sessions and uh, public sessions for people to um, share feedback on the budget. Then it moves to uh, February where the uh, request um, goes to the county executive and then the county council. We usually hear between March and May um, from the um, county executive first, followed by the uh, county council. In May, the county council provides a final approval and then in July, those funds are available um, for us to use for the next fiscal year. And so that is the overview of our process, how we have spent money this last year, why it's so critically important that we continue to engage and have these conversations and sharing with everyone pretty openly that it is we should, no one in this room should be shocked if we read a news article and it talks about um, cuts to the state of Maryland spending around blueprint because uh, there have been many signals indicating that and it's why we have to do the important, the heavy, uh, uh, difficult work of really uh, scrutinizing our expenditures and identifying what our priorities are and making sure that whatever we put in the budget is directly aligned to our um, priorities. And we wanna hear from you. Uh, what do you think we should be um, strongly considering for inclusion? Um, and we want you to have an opportunity to interact with each other and then for us to interact as a whole group. And so Ms. Oni Jala will Thank you, Dr. Rogers, and I saw Board Member Harvey, welcome. Thank you for coming. Good evening. Okay, so as I explained in the beginning of um, tonight's session, we're going to have an opportunity for you to talk amongst yourselves at your table, and we really want you to reflect on the two questions that you see on the screen, and it may be a bit hard for those who are in the back of the room, but I'll read them out loud. What are the school system's greatest areas of need that should be prioritized in the FY26 operating budget request? And then please share your feedback on two to three strategies, programs, or efforts you believe are currently working to improve outcomes for all students. And what we found is, as you all are having these conversations um, and engaging in, in discussion about what's working, maybe what some areas of improvement are, when we then have that opportunity to report out, Dr. Rogers gets to hear firsthand what you all are experiencing, whether as a parent, as a student, a member of the community. So we'll take a few minutes to engage in conversation around these two specific questions. We'll walk around with the microphone, have you select one person to report out on what you all shared, and then immediately following that, we'll open it up to general question and answer where Dr. Rogers will answer your questions on all things budget. So my colleagues are walking around with chart paper. This is your opportunity, again, in those two questions to jot down some ideas some thoughts and then when we come back together we will prepare to report out thank you so much
All right, if we can come back together, I'll invite Dr. Rogers up front. Okay, so I will come around to each table and we ask that you just pick one, two things that you're going to share from the top things that you discussed, because we see a lot of bullet points on these papers, which is great. We are collecting all of the chart paper and sharing this feedback with Dr. Rogers. So if you kind of want to summarize, synthesize what you all discussed as you're reporting out, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. As I walk around with the mic, please don't take the microphone from me because we'll be doing a little bit of this. And I always win. I always have the mic. Um, and then, of course, just try and keep your uh, sharing out as concise as possible so we get to everyone. But most importantly, we provide you with time to ask Dr. Rogers your direct budget questions. So we will get started at this table. Who's my spokesperson? Okay, thank you. Uh, so the items we have, some of them are needs and strategies, but I'll go through them. So the first one was prioritize staffing support to deal with the different developmental needs in the classroom. Um, decreasing class size, so those two were our top. Um, then the third being increasing full day pre-K seats. Um, fourth, diversity and inclusion training and implementation just to support um, the different diversities, even from eco, eco, uh, economic backgrounds. Um, and then fifth, offer extracurricular activities. Um, lastly, was a more of a question for Food for Thought, but what format is used to document the need in this zero-based approach? Um, is there a template document or is this just documented through discussions? Thank you so much. Do we have anything over here? Okay. Uh, we have a nice little list here, uh, one through five. Um, this was something that uh, I actually spoke about uh, last year when I was here. Um, I think it's very important that we start to um, give more transparency to the communities, to the, to the parents. I think that when you're doing any sort of budgeting, if you don't really know where the money trail is going, if you don't know how much certain contractors are bidding, if you don't really, if you can't nickel and dime the budget, then you really don't have real oversight over how the money is being spent. And I think that's exactly what is threatening the the entire, you know, the entire blueprint it's going to come down to transparency and who can advocate for it. If you want to make it a partisan thing, then only... Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right, so uh, to uh, get second, uh, get teachers paid, uh -huh. you know? I think that it needs to be more competitive. Okay. I think that, the, you know, I think we all think that they should be getting a substantial, especially in Maryland, right, where it's one of the most expensive states in the entire nation. All right, one more thing. Um, you wanna? Um, I'm gonna pass it. Okay, quickly. Um, just um, the support of the community school facilitator. It should be in every school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Short and concise. Thank you. All right. Who's my spokesperson here? Yeah. Okay. Um, we said that. Um, you know, we we didn't we weren't sure how Maryland salaries compare with other school districts. Um, and also in the presentation, you know, we were wondering about reading programs. Um, they spoke about like math programs, but um, there's still a lot of students that, you know, are having trouble reading into the higher grades. Um, we agreed with, you know, keeping the class sizes smaller. And then for the second question about things that are working, we, um, I know in this school particularly, they have like the uh, a GOAT award program that seems to be really helping with um, like respect and helping in enforce the school like um, mantra kind of. And um, they also have a readathon, which is pretty motivational for the students, so. Thank you. Um, so we talked about early childhood education and behavioral competency and how we're seeing improvements and we want to see more of it over time and um, and in particular you know the ties to special education um, and having teachers and in-class support um, for special programs and professional development type activities okay. thank, thank you. you and I think we have one more thing one thing to share one. yeah one. One. one so I was just using some drawings that goes with school so that because we're, since we're talking about BCPS and some part schools and stuff, I made some drawings so that so that it can be like schooly and stuff. And you like Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Much more <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Did I get everyone? Okay. 
Dr. Rogers, do you want to reflect on this first and then we do general questions? Okay. All right, I started taking notes, so I might have missed, it, uh, missed some of the, up. Oh, I didn't miss anything. <laughs> All right, um, decreased class size was a comment that was made. Um, uh, so one of the reasons why I share that 83% of our budget goes to salaries and benefits, um, and then if you further subdivide it, 63% go to instruction, is because that's what we invest in the most heavily. When we were really um, analyzing everything last year, we realized that for our intermediate elementary students, that's where we had the largest class sizes in our system, um, even higher than middle school and high school students. And so this year we were able to decrease class sizes in grades three through five, and we were um, looking forward to continuing that path. We'll have to wait and see what the revenue looks like to see um, you know, uh, more changes that we can make in that area. We did receive um, comments around uh, support uh, for students uh, in special needs. That's an area that we invested in heavily this school year, um, not only uh, the IEP facilitators in the elementary schools and the special education students, uh, excuse me, teachers, pre-K through 12, but also um, making sure that we were providing for pre-K in particular an adult assistance, a special education teacher um, as needed in addition to the uh, teacher and the paraeducator in the classroom. I did hear a call for in increased full day pre-K I would love to, a reminder, we went up to 2,000 in one year. Um, and so, I mean, uh, we're definitely committed, uh, but it, it's not likely that we're gonna be able to expand at the same rate in uh, this upcoming uh, fiscal year. Um, support around uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, not only do we have a uh, cultural proficiency team that does that work and provides the foundational training to members of Team BCPS. Um, what we're probably more excited about is as part of the level setting that we're doing around high quality instruction using research for better teaching, skillful teacher. Um, part of that work is uh, recognizing what student needs, what um, those instructional strategies are that we should be employing in every classroom so we can tie it directly to outcomes for students. And so we're very excited about what that's going to mean for our students in our classes. Um, expanding extracurricular activities, uh, providing teacher pay. Um, we are among the top in the state of Maryland with teacher pay. Um, just a few short years ago, we were in the middle, bottom quartile, union president shaking her head, fact checking on the spot. We are uh, among the top for teacher pay. Um, and so we are proud of that, um, as well as we're one of the counties that has a multi-year budget. Um, so our teachers uh, and all staff know that they're being uh, taken care of. And that also is a part of when we're developing the budget process, we have to account for agreements that we've already made as well. Um, uh, the transparency of the budget. So one of the things that uh, Baltimore County Public Schools has been lauded for is the transparency of the budget. Um, our process where we actually go and engage with stakeholders where there's multiple ways for people to provide feedback. If you go to Budget 101 on our website right now, you'll find data um, going back to fiscal year 2018 and we're planning for fiscal year 2026. As a reminder, there is a lot of information that's out there on the budget and one of the things that I do before I even prepare the final recommendation to the board is I share the feedback publicly at a board meeting. What did principals say were the priorities as well as what did our stakeholders say and whether or not there were trends across different stakeholder groups. Um, so I, I think uh, there is a lot of information and uh, that is available um, to our communities in terms of uh, budgets. Um, 
And for people who are more interested in uh, specific amounts, uh, if you go to Board Docs, that's where you'll find we present all of our uh, contracts that are over a certain cost to our Board of Education for approval. Um, in Board Docs, there are the sup uh, supplementary materials that um, speak to exactly the amount of money that is being allocated for what area and um, specific names of the vendors and et cetera. So for people who are more interested in uh, that level of detail, it is available and it is archived um, on our website that you can uh, go and take a look at that. Uh, community school facilitator. Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to, the last board meeting, provide a report to our board and the public on a community school, uh, Sandalwood in particular, and uh, the work that Shannon Amont does over there as their community school facilitator is phenomenal. We would love to have that in every single school. However, uh, it you know the state decides on what the parameters are in which schools qualify uh, to become the next uh, community schools, and that's based on the economically disadvantaged um, uh, percentage in your school, as well as some other uh, parameters in areas of need. So we are. Um, you know, moving past 90 community schools at 176. Um, to be perfectly honest, when we talk about the looming fiscal crisis around Blueprint, uh, the concentration of poverty grants, which is uh, the funding source for community schools, um, is a very large sum of money. And so that is the area that we're looking at very closely. Uh, we believe, you know, the state is definitely committed to the work that has already started in community schools, but um, in terms of expansion, and what it might mean for uh, the future is something that we're paying close attention to. Um, I've addressed how do we um, compare in terms of salaries. Um, our reading programs, we have uh, provided some updates on elementary literacy and um, secondary literacy, what you can uh, look forward to upcoming in board meetings. We're going to provide an update on our reading interventions for elementary and secondary. And then in the spring, based on the data that we have from last year's um, first level pilot for secondary literacy and this year's second part of the pilot for grades 6 through 12 and literacy, we're going to bring a recommendation forward to the board with all of that data. Um, and I think I've, that's everything on the list. Okay, great. So now we are going to open it up for general questions. I'll come around again with the mic. Um, please keep it concise. Also, if you have very specific situations uh, pertaining to your child and something going on at a school, we have a number of staff here tonight. They are all in the back for some reason, just ready, waiting. <laughs> Wave your hands, please. We have executive directors, our chief academic officer, we have our chief human resources officer, our chief operations officer, and so many, and chief of schools. You almost escaped, Dr. Jones. I see you in our chief of staff. So, all of these individuals are here ready to support you if you have specific needs. So this time really is for your budget questions for Dr. Rogers, um, and she's happy to answer those questions. If I see that you're starting to kind of get into some personal stories, you might get a little nudge from me, so. And I'll do so um, as quietly as possible. All right, any questions? Now's the time. Yes. Hello. I, I had one, uh, yeah. two questions. I'll make it super quick, oh, though. Um, I know that you mentioned that uh, 60000 was the starting teacher salary. Do we plan on increasing it in order to remain competitive next year? And also, that are we also increasing um, the rate of pay for experienced teachers that, you know, to, in order to retain them as well? Yes and yes. Um, and that's already posted as part of our three-year agreement. Uh, not only do we uh, have increases in terms of steps, but also the cost of living. Yep. Just, just for my edification, what do you guys consider a um, appropriate class size? Uh, that varies by grade level and by subject. Um, the smallest class size, uh, do we have 20 or 22 at pre-K? Up to 22? Pre-K pre three is 15. Pre-K four, 22, um, uh, comparable numbers in kindergarten, um, 
first grade, what is it? 22, and then um, we were at 25 for grades three through five. We were able to cut, reduce that by one for this first year. So that would be average around 24, although probably visited close to 40 schools by now this school year. I'm not seeing um, you know, that capacity met. And then middle school and high school, um, a little different. In the higher 20s, um, you can have in the uh, 30s, depending on the subject, if you're talking about music or you're talking about physical education at the middle school and the high school level, um, that's when you can talk about you know, the upper 30s. And if it's a gym class, it can be in the uh, 40s. You're welcome. Hello, hello. Uh, so I wrote it so I say it perfectly. <laughs> so I wanted to, I was wondering, and a lot of teachers I think are kind of in a state of panic about this. Uh, how will the county or BCPS adapt if federal funding is cut or worse, we lose the Department of Education at the federal level? Great question. And we're all going to breathe. We're gonna pause. We're gonna take one day at a time. Um, and then we'll adjust. And the other thing is, if we're being honest about it, we have a $2.6 billion budget. 10% of our budget comes from federal and other sources. So the vast majority of our budget comes from state and local funding sources. Um, not that we want to lose money from anywhere, uh, but it's a much easier lift to address 5 to 8% of the budget as opposed to, if we were talking about local share, that's 49% of the budget. So just tell everybody to breathe. We're going to take it one step at a time, and we will adjust accordingly. We'll do what's in the best interest of the school system. Yes. Uh, back to uh, that transparency question. Is, is there a, a profit loss for the county? Like, it, like when we go back to last year and actually go over the, the entire like statement of what the goals were and how the money was dispersed. Is there a profit loss for, for the county? That we can Baltimore County Public Schools is nonprofit. Um, and so we don't do anything to um, gain a profit. Um, it, again, uh, I will um, refer you to the resources online so you can learn more about our budget and our accounting processes. But we don't do anything for a profit. The only, the closest profit um, entity related to the school system would be uh, maybe a booster or a PTO, and that's only to raise funds for the good of the school. Uh, but there's no office or division that is. Um, so maybe you could help. What's the correct term when it's a uh, when it's a nonprofit like uh, like 2.6 billion dollars? How does that get spent over two years? Where does where does the actual like each column? each row in an Excel sheet, like, I don't, if it's not a PL, like, I, I don't, you know. I would um, call your attention to, although we're gonna make changes for next year, there's a several hundred page budget book on the website that goes through every division and every department and how we spend money. The vast majority of our money, um, about 82% of the $2.6 billion goes to salaries and benefits. So you're talking about a very small percentage to do everything else that is required for 20,000 staff, 111,000 students, and 176 buildings. Yes, okay. So earlier when you had the timeline up, you mentioned how you meet with the principals and you were talking about the, um, the three factors of enrollment, documenting need, and programs. So what format, is there like a template or do you, is it through meeting with the principals that you identify what their needs are for their particular schools? So it's both. Um, and the meetings with the, so first the principals received, I think yesterday, the principals uh, budget priority survey is something that we've uh, developed. So every principal has the opportunity to uh, provide direct feedback in terms of the budget um, 
process and what we should prioritize so this way we're able to see trends across school and make sure what we're investing in um, is aligned with the need. That's how we knew that we needed to um, double down on our efforts last year to invest heavily in elementary school. Um, we knew that looking at analyzing prior budgets, um, we were spending more money in secondary and we were also seeing the needs growing at a greater rate in elementary school. So while every school is represented in that budget, I don't go line for line and say Miss Fort Camp wants this or or anything like that, but I'm but I'm able to see in the aggregate, I'm able to look at zones, look at levels, those kinds of things. But in addition to that, we have a monthly um, professional learning meeting where we meet and we talk in small groups. For elementary, we do that um, by zone because we have 110 elementary schools and then we meet with secondary and that's when we have the face-to-face -face discussions. That's when um, last year I shared, um, here's what I know, here's what um, I found, here's what we're thinking, and then there's small group discussion and then there's whole group, and, based, and it's an iterative process where we come back to it month by month, and then this is how we um, come to consensus around the priorities. It's also an opportunity for us to um, share information along the way so no one is surprised um when january comes and we have to then present to a larger group that we're all on the same page about what's most important for the students that we're serving now so thank you for that question all right i think we've answered all of the questions i do want to draw your attention to a lot of what Dr. Rogers has already shared, all the ways that you can get involved um, through the survey. I emailed you right before you walked in the building, so please make sure you complete that survey. Um, we have it available in English and Spanish. If you need other languages, please let us know. Uh, once Dr. Roger, Dr. Rogers presents her recommended budget, we'll have Board of Education public hearings, our area, Area Advisory Councils have meetings on the budget. And then, of course, our lovely Budget 101 website. If you go to bcps.org, right in the search box, and it's also in uh, the resources at the bottom, across the bottom of the website, type in Budget 101, it will bring it right up. We have even more detail, greater detail about the budget, about the process, um, where you can find additional resources. And as we move through this process, we will be adding more resources to that website. And then if you have nothing happening on Thursday and just you feel like joining us again, we'll be at Windsor Mill Middle School, 6 to 7 p.m. Please spread the word. On the 21st, we'll be at Cockeysville. And then to round out our budget series, we will be at Perry Hall Middle School. So a lot of opportunities for members of the Team BCPS community to come out, share their thoughts, ask Dr. Rogers questions, and then be a part of this very important process. So with that, we want to thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out tonight. And also thank Principal Fortcamp for opening up your beautiful building to us tonight. Thank you so much. Please continue to stay engaged in this budget process, and we look forward to seeing you at a future meeting. Thank you all so much, and drive safely. Take care.